All right, hello everyone. Welcome back. And as promised, today we're going to be talking about Ted Kaczynski. So I'm sure if you followed the news at all, you saw this was the, the week Ted finally kicked the bucket. And uh, I've actually been planning to do something like this for a while. Um, I always thought it was interesting. I mean, I had a little bit of a, a phase of all that kind of stuff. Like I saw people in the chat were like, oh, I hope he's actually read the manifesto and all this kind of thing. It's like manifesto. Uh, I've read the Chad Hag book on Ted K. All right, I've got the the deep lore. I actually interviewed Chad Hag before. Um, he's like the best guy that talks and writes about this stuff. Um, but yeah, I used to be very interested in the the anti text stuff, uh, Jacques Ellul. Um, you know all the related uh, sort of intellectual schools around that, peak oil, all that kind of stuff. John Michael Greer, but. I saw when Ted died, there was this big reaction. This was going around a lot on, on Twitter. It was actually a tweet I responded to where I said, I do this stream where people were like, oh, you know, uh, the, the, the libtards like disavow Ted Kaczynski because he did violence, but no one can prove him wrong. And there was this, this seemed to be like the take everyone settled on that uh, Ted Kaczynski, you know, he might have gone too far in a few places. But he's basically correct, and no one can ever prove this incredible critique yet wrong. And I had been thinking of doing a video like this for a while, like there's a whole Anprim side of the distant right. And, you know, I like to formulate content kind of answering a question, like the basic questions that sometimes people don't interrogate that are actually very important to these kinds of things. Why civilization? Uh, why not just uh, stay in a primitive condition, right? So, yeah, I saw the reaction to this, and I'm like, you know, these people, they have very contradictory ideas. Like, there's people that were in my chat uh, in the build-up to this saying that they're never going to watch my channel again. Uh, devastated. And uh, someone said I was anti-white to disagree with Ted Kaczynski, which is kind of funny. But I don't think any of these people are consistent, because they're probably also, like, nationalists that support nationalist political movements, which is definitely something Kaczynski didn't support. Uh, you know, you can't have Ted Kaczynski's ideas and hold a lot of the things that the dissident right does, right? Uh, I know people like to kind of splice thinkers together. These kinds of meme thinkers you get in the, the dissident right, you know, a little bit of Julius Evola, a little bit of Ted Kaczynski. It doesn't really work like that. And I do think Kaczynski had some very good insights, which I'm going to go over. And this is going to be pretty in-depth, right? I'm going to cover... Uh, the aspects of his manifesto, his critiques of the left, his take on technology, uh, the whole like basis of his worldview, going to interrogate uh, how he justifies aspects of it. Uh, and then I'm going to look at what I think he got right and what I think he got wrong. If anything, I mean, if the, if the final take to come out of all of this is that, well, the distant right just can't, literally can't like argue against this uh, Luddite that advocated um, a violent political revolution and they have no justification for high civilization. I think that's kind of a problem. Um, but I don't, like I said, I don't think the people that are Kaczynskiites on, on Twitter and online are very serious uh, because it's, it's not anything he advocated. He didn't advocate creating an online uh, subculture around his ideas or something. We know what he advocated. But that's enough of that. I'm going to get into this. You can, of course, send super chats. I'll read at the end. I'm thinking about a new format. I think maybe um, I like to do these videos, uh, you know, some of the slides, some of the presentations, a bit more research. I did a lot of research for this one. Uh, I'm thinking maybe like I'll combine the, the video production and the, the, the live streams and that if I stream these presentations and then take super chats, maybe I can like re-upload the presentation on its own. Or maybe I'll just leave the whole stream up. But I'm thinking maybe something like that. You know, maybe I'll start streaming off YouTube and then I'll just upload the presentation after. But yeah, let me know what you think of this format. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll do more of it going forward. So this is, before we start, this is the, these are the sources I'm going to be using. Um, obviously, industrial society and its future. That's Kaczynski's manifesto. Technological slavery is a, a book of his collected writings. It has his manifesto in it, but also letters that he wrote from prison. He had a lot of exchanges with uh, David Scribina, who's a, another anti-tech philosopher. Uh, 
Chad Hag, the philosophy of Ted Kaczynski, I mentioned him already. Chad Hag is very into anti-tech ideas. He has a lot of videos on Ted Kaczynski on his YouTube channel. Uh, he has this book. He has other books about peak oil, about the effects of peak oil industrial civilization on, on memes and on intellectual movements. Very interesting thinker. Kind of comes at it from, like, kind of has a similar approach to me in terms of, uh, you know, using these platforms to, you know, present ideas from thinkers sort of outside the mainstream and i did see he did a live stream he said he'd be watching this so hopefully i don't uh i don't do too bad a job the metaphysics of technology by david skurbina who i mentioned he had a lot of correspondence with ted kaczynski when kaczynski was in prison uh you may have seen him seen him around these kinds of circles of the internet because he also has a book on like arguing for jesus mythicism not even mythicism but basically that you know an outright hoax uh arguing that saint paul kind of faked christianity so he writes on some topics very outside the mainstream as well but he wrote this one the metaphysics of technology and trying to kind of create a deeper critique of of technology from that kind of kaczynski perspective and he covers kaczynski in a chapter or two in that and like i said he has correspondences with kaczynski as well which illuminated a lot of Kaczynski's ideas. And then that one in the, the top right is, is the Unabomber and the Origins of Anti-Tech Radicalism, which is a paper written by a guy called Sean Fleming. And that's interesting because it gets into what inspired Kaczynski, uh, which isn't often discussed. I'll get into why that is, but we do see him as a very original thinker, right? People think his critique of the left and his idea of the power process and all this, that he's a super original thinker. It's actually, it's a little bit more complicated. He did crib a lot of ideas and kind of reword them, but we'll get into that. But that's an interesting paper for background on where Kaczynski was coming from that you'd miss otherwise. Now, who was Ted Kaczynski, right? Uh, well, he was a certified genius, measured IQ of 167. I think he was measured at that when he was a teenager. When he was in jail, they did another test on him that tested at 135, I think. But he entered Harvard at 15. He completed a PhD in mathematics. Became a professor the same year. Wasn't really rated as a professor. Wasn't popular with his students. He just tended to read from mathematics books. Uh, didn't really engage with his students. Seems like throughout his youth, he was extremely introverted, um, suffered with with depression and a very avoidant personality. When they did the psychological examination of him, that was one of the things the psychologist thought was that he had uh, that he was kind of borderline avoidant personality. But he retired in 1969, kind of spontaneously. No one was expecting this, just decided to retire and live in the cabin in the woods that I believe he built with his brother in Montana. And of course, he began his bombing campaign, it would become known as the Unabomber. 78, he posted the first one to university professor, later businessmen, corporate executives. The first person he killed was a computer store owner. Uh, there was also uh, an executive of a timber company, and I think I believe another one as well. Uh, and in 1995, Kaczynski sent his manifesto, Industrial Society and its Future, to New York Times and the Washington Post for publication. He promised to stop his bombing campaign if this was published. And the FBI told him to publish it and then sent out a request for tips based on the writing. And his brother actually recognized the uh, prose style, thought it was Ted, and handed him into the FBI. And of course, they, they got a warrant and found that he had a ready-made bomb in his home and uh, thousands of pages of, of writing where he outlined his beliefs. And he was arrested in 1996, but he continued to write about his ideas on anti-tech from prison. Obviously, for the kind of mainstream narrative on Kaczynski, that's where the story ends, is he has a killing spree and he gets arrested. Uh, but he did continue to write extensively and develop his ideas. But the core ideas never changed, of course. Uh, if you read Industrial Society and its future, you have a pretty, pretty solid idea of his whole worldview. Now, of course, a lot of people have been talking about this since his death, Kaczynski and his relationship with MKUltra. 
In his first year at Harvard, Kaczynski was recruited to a psychological experiment that would last three years, and it was headed by former OSS employee Henry Murray. The OSS, of course, was the precursor to the CIA. Every week, someone would meet Kaczynski to verbally abuse him. The experiment was part of the CIA's clandestine illegal program, MKUltra, aimed at finding ways to brainwash and psychologically break people under interrogation. At least, that was the stated purpose of MKUltra. There's all sorts of speculation about the real purpose. Was it to train assassins like the one that killed Robert F. Kennedy that had uh, no memory of uh, any of the event? And there's a lot of strange political assassinations in that time. But anyway, we know this was happening. Uh, we know there was very unethical experiments going on. And Kaczynski was one of the victims. Now, according to the psychological evaluation, uh, the young Kaczynski had persistent and intense sexual fantasies about being a woman. In 1967, he went to a psychiatrist to discuss a sex change operation, but he changed his mind while he was in the waiting room. This is one of the things that came out of his psychological evaluation when he was arrested. Um, obviously, there was a question of if he was sane to stand trial. And this female psychologist, uh, who, uh, whose name I'm forgetting right now, did this very in-depth report on him. She interviewed him for 22 hours, got him to do one of these uh, MMPI tests. Um, her conclusion was that he was a paranoid schizophrenic and that he had paranoid personality disorder, but he was not insane. Uh, which might sound like a contradiction, but essentially that he had these paranoid delusions, but he knew the difference between right and wrong. He knew uh, his actions were wrong, so therefore uh, he could be competent to stand trial. Other people have analyzed that report and analyzed Kaczynski. There's another kind of famous forensic psychologist that concluded he wasn't a paranoid schizophrenic, but that he had a schizoid personality disorder, a schizotypal. Either way, in his 20s, he was extremely introverted, suffered a lot with depression and anxiety. Also, according to this psychologist, had uh, signs of avoidant personality disorder, which is, you know, a tendency to be extremely sensitive to, to criticism and to uh, interactions with people. Uh, and that's a pattern that seems to be there in his, in his 20s and 30s. Based on the her basis for the, the paranoid delusions was that he came to believe that his family members were plotting against him at a young age and that he was being controlled by technology. Now, Kaczynski wrote from prison multiple times that this was kind of politically motivated, that he was not schizophrenic, and that a couple of other psychologists had analyzed the same uh, results and found that he was sane. Uh, he did obviously score high in a lot of these things like, uh, you know, avoidance and he obviously battled with depression and so on. And he had this, uh, what's it, autogynophilia where he had fantasies about himself as a woman, considered speaking to a therapist, but changed his mind. But certainly a somewhat disturbed individual in his early life, um, you know, kind of reminiscent of, of John Nash and a very talented mathematician. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of speculation, uh, to what extent was he, was he motivated by these things? To what extent was he, was he thinking clearly? I think if you read his writing, I mean, he, he certainly makes a very rational case. So I definitely wouldn't write anything off, uh, from Kaczynski based on these psychological reports. That's for sure. Now, Kaczynski's argument, very simply, I took this from the metaphysics of technology by Skrbina, because this is a good uh, summary. Humans evolved under primitive low-tech conditions, and it is these conditions to which we are genetically and psychologically best suited. Modern society is radically different than our natural state, and thus imposes unprecedented stress on us. The stress will increase in the coming years as technology advances, and therefore we will have to adapt. Uh, sorry, therefore we will have to take increasingly drastic measures to adapt to it. Measures that will include genetic, physiological, and psychological manipulation. And number four, there is no way to reform the technological system so as to avoid such a dehumanizing outcome, which obviously leads to uh, his radical conclusions about the way forward. Now, in the manifesto, he outlines 
the basis, this is really kind of the core basis for his worldview is the power process. Uh, got a little typo there, sorry about that. But humans have an innate biological need to engage in the power process, which very simply is expending physical effort, working toward goals autonomously. And Kaczynski outlines four uh, components that need to be there in the power process, which is a goal, an effort, uh, expelled to get there uh, the success and then a feeling of freedom that comes afterwards and this is for kind of simple biological needs right um knocking down a, a coconut or i don't know hunting a, a hog or something right but that's how we're satisfied that's what we're evolved for uh, we're not evolved to uh sit watching media content for two hours we're supposed to be uh satisfying these basic biological needs and that's what our um, you know, that's what our, our system rewards us for and, and gives us happiness for. And that's that's really the point of happiness. And everything else is, is kind of downstream of, of that basic biological programming. We're not just satisfied by, by the object of desire, but by the process of attaining it. A man who could have anything he wanted on command would be deeply unhappy. Blaise Pascal talked about this uh, in his writings about sort of human condition and happiness. You know, like the gambler would not be happy if you just gave him the day's winnings at the start of the day. He wants the process of having to strive for those winnings. Um, he wants the feeling of success about competing the other players and so on. Basically, what he wants is to partake in the power process. And Kaczynski makes a similar uh, analogy when he talks about leisured aristocrats versus martial aristocrats. He says that history shows that leisured aristocrats tend to become decadent. This is not true for fighting aristocracies that have to struggle to maintain their power, but leisured, secure aristocracies that have no need to exert themselves usually become bored, hedonistic, and demoralized, even though they have power. This shows that power is not enough. One must have goals toward which to exercise one's power. So like I said, this is really foundational to his worldview because one thing about Kaczynski is he's very popular with, obviously, people that have this kind of uh, deep green tendency, ecological concerns. And that's what you find on kind of the radical right is you find people that are sort of, uh, what would you say, like pagan in outlook or, or even have a, a kind of, you know, a more spiritual, like pantheist view of nature and abhor the desacralization of nature that's brought about by industrialism and the modern world. That wasn't Kaczynski's critique, right? Uh, Kaczynski is very much human focused. Um, Nowhere in his manifesto is he, is he making some kind of deep ecological critique where he's talking about the inherent value of diversity of life and so on. And I, I'm sure this obviously entered as a concern to him. Uh, people say he decided to take the radical actions he did when he saw that a, a road he regularly walked on, or sorry, a path he regularly walked on was having a road built on it, that that kind of pushed him over the edge. Um, but in terms of his critique of technological society, it's quite utilitarian, actually. It's not this um, spiritual or desacralized nature kind of thing. It's this is how humans are adapted and programmed for happiness. This is how technological civilization undoes that. And this is the process that's going in that's going to make this worse and cause more suffering. And therefore, we need to return to a primitive state. Uh, so it's it's a pretty human focused critique, which is not something you see that much in these kinds of uh, deep green circles. Now, related to the power process is surrogate activities. Due to technology, the effort to satisfy biological needs has been reduced to triviality. But despite the lives of comfort provided by technology, we still have an innate need to feel like we are engaging in the power process. The system, that's a term he likes to use rather than... Uh, you know, liberalism or capitalism or any of this, it's just a, a broader technological system, provides harmless surrogate activities to satisfy this need. Instead of working to find food, we cheer for a football team or study marine biology. And that's kind of important as well. I know people hear surrogate activities from Kaczynski and they think he just means like, I don't know, collecting star wars figurines or something but he really includes everything like philosophy he uses the example of marine biology when he's talking i think he was talking about the the emperor of japan 
Um, but yeah, any any of these intellectual activities. I mean, Kaczynski was a mathematician, and I think he would even consider mathematics a, a surrogate activity. Any of these intellectual pursuits that are uh, not immediately related to satisfying biological urges. He says, we use the term surrogate activity to designate an activity that is directed toward an artificial goal that people set up for themselves merely in order to have some goal to work toward. Or, let us say, merely for the sake of the fulfillment that they get from pursuing the goal. Leftist psychology. This is obviously one of the things Kaczynski is, is most popular for in the radical right, his critique of the left, which is quite on point. And there is a little bit of, of originality here that's very insightful from Kaczynski. He offers leftist act activism itself as an example of a surrogate activity. And for him, leftism isn't a set of political beliefs so much as a psychological type with identifiable traits. These traits include over-socialization and feelings of inferiority. Kaczynski says, deep inside, the leftist feels like a loser. And anytime Kaczynski talks about leftism in his writings, he is talking about a certain type of people. You know, he's talking about keeping leftists out of the anti-tech movement. He's never He never relates it to any belief, anti-capitalism or anything else. Uh, it is like a, a morphological type. But the two key aspects of leftist psychology are feelings of inferiority and over socialization let's break them down feelings of inferiority under this Kaczynski includes low self-esteem feelings of powerlessness depressive tendencies defeatism guilt self-hatred it's no coincidence that leftists identify most with the groups who are considered inferior in some way in fact leftists themselves actually consider these minority groups inferior which is why they identify with them he says, leftists tend to hate anything that has an image of being strong, good, and successful. They hate America, they hate Western civilization, they hate white males, they hate rationality. So the leftist, superior, the leftist hatred of superiority actually extends to denying the validity of IQ tests, mental illness, and even rationality itself. Because if you accept the existence of truth, that implies an inferior side, which would be untrue. So I think this is a, a pretty apt observation by Kaczynski that they're just constantly at war with hierarchy. He says in, in one of his uh, one of his essays, you know, if the leftists got every demand they want, if you ask the leftists, what do you want to see implemented in the next two years? And you just gave them everything they wanted, right? All of the redistribution, all of the social justice and so on. He said nothing would really change in terms of their activism because they would just find something else to attack. They'd find something else to destroy because they have this psychological urge. There's no end point. There's no ultimate ideological goal of, of the leftists. You know, they used to be focused on economic justice and the working class, and that was the kind of skin suit they wore. And now it's about racial justice and LGBT, and then it became about um, transgender rights and so on. So it, it, it's, it's this constant uh, need to engage in the power process, ultimately, that sends them uh, on this chase and uses leftism as, as a means of, of expressing their desire for power, which we'll get into a little bit more here. But the other aspect is over socialization. Now, socialization is the way people are trained to behave and think in a way that fits in with society. Right? Obviously, you socialize children to, you know, respect their elders and, and have manners and so on. Um, and one way we do this is through shame. But, of course, in some cases, this uh, goes a little bit too far and the child internalizes the shame and they become ashamed of themselves rather than their actions. Now, the psychological leash of being over-socialized results in feelings of powerlessness and self-hatred. Leftists are over-socialized. They deprive themselves of freedom by over-assimilating to the system. But this creates a need to identify with an ideology that embodies the agency they have denounced. The over-socialized leftist has a need to assert their autonomy by rebelling, but they cannot challenge the most basic values of society. Thus, they tend to do exactly what society demands, even if they claim radical opposition to the system. Again, this is a, a good insight. But yeah, essentially these people, they have... Related to his feelings of powerlessness and feelings of shame, they have 
uh, internalize these feelings of shame. Um, they're very kind of married to the system values, but they still need to participate in the power process some way. And if anything, they have a greater desire to participate in something that's like tangible and powerful and aggressive and like symbolically uh, powerful precisely because they've divide, uh, denied it at that individual level, right? So it is a kind of cope, it is a kind of compensation. Leftist radicals, then, it's no surprise, tend to come from the bourgeoisie rather than the working class. They advocate for things like race and gender equality, pacifism, freedom of expression, all values which the system itself encourages. So Kaczynski uses that as kind of uh, empirical validation for his theory, right? Uh, you would expect these people to be very much uh, kind of wedded to the system uh, in that they've, they've internalized the values of the system so much. And, you know, lo and behold, it is these uh, kind of privileged SJW types that, that engage in this. Um, his insight about their, their feelings of, of superiority over the groups they advocate for is, is, is interesting as well. Um, I'll get into that a little bit in, in a couple of slides, right? But, you know, basically they secretly or maybe subconsciously see some of these groups that they're advocating for as inferior, even if they would never admit it. Um, you know, they maybe see some of these racial groups they advocate for as, as less intelligent and so on. But that's actually why they advocate for them, even though they'll claim equality. Uh, they're identifying with the inferiority and they kind of want to act out against the uh, norms or values that would enforce that distinction right even though they kind of know it on a, a deep level um people are spamming in the chat jeff gary Epi. jeff can do responses i'll watch it and i might do response to him as well but if you're just gonna like spam my chat people should just uh you should just ban people honestly uh i give free rent to ban whoever you want my mods um so this is the systems need is trick because leftists are too over-socialized to really challenge the values of the system, most leftist demands are simply uh, demanding the system be true to its own values. For example, the system doesn't want religion, racism, or other prejudices to get in the way of assimilating new workers into the techno-industrial system. And all leftists do actually is make the desire for equality explicit, and they work to realize it through their pseudo-rebellion. Many leftists push for affirmative action, for moving black people into high prestige jobs, for improved education in black schools and more money for such schools. The way of life of the black underclass they regard as a social disgrace. They want to integrate the black man into the system, make him a business executive, a lawyer, a scientist, just like upper middle class white people. Achieving total political control through revolution and dismantling technological society is incompatible since this kind of tech. Uh, of political control is only possible with technology. Due to leftist psychology, uh, they could not be trusted to dismantle the system, even if they did gain control. Now, obviously, there's plenty of examples of this today, and since Ted wrote this, uh, I mean, this is just kind of a, a common thing on, on the right now, right, and even uh, in the center, to, to point out how the left kind of reinforces uh, values of the oligarchs right and you know it is the ridiculousness of the sjw's uh, claiming that you know capitalist oligarchs are somehow like conservative uh christ like stuffy christians that want like some kind of fascist closed borders dictatorship and so they go out and they advocate for uh equality and they advocate for uh, absolute feminism where you know women can be in the workplace and open borders where there'll be masses of of uh, of, of migrants to lower wages and, and uh, among the native workforce and they see this as rebellion and Kaczynski's claim is simply that all of these forms of pseudo rebellion they're basically based on integrating people more deeply into the technological system right the leftist wants to enforce human rights they want to enforce equality they don't want any corner of the world to have uh, sort of backward bigoted beliefs that deny uh, LGBT people or other minorities their rights. Uh, and so in this push for equality, this, uh, you know, this sort of uh, noble push uh, for fairness and justice, what they're actually pushing for is to break down these, uh, these divisions, these barriers that exist for the oligarchs 
to turn everyone into kind of Western consumer that can work long hours and purchase the, the junk that the technological system produces. And they never stop to question uh, if this is a, a real rebellion against the system, because, of course, they've uh, deeply internalized these values. He also writes against conservatism pretty briefly. Uh, he mostly focuses on leftist psychology, but he's also scathing of conservatives. He says the conservatives are fools. They whine about the decay of traditional values, yet they enthusiastically support technological progress and economic growth. Apparently, it never occurs to them that you can't make rapid, drastic changes in the technology and the economy of a society without causing rapid changes in all other aspects of the society as well. And that such rapid changes inevitably break down traditional values. I don't think I need to get too much into that. Obviously, you can think of ample examples, right? A conservative that supports technological progress. And you can think of the uh, revolutionary effects of things like technological advances like birth control and, and so on. Um, and of course, his, his final conclusion is the anti-tech revolution, right? He advocates an immediate revolution against the system. The more the system grows, the greater will be the destruction brought about by an eventual collapse. Uh, we can't embrace accelerationism because the end technology is accelerating towards is actually the end of our species and the irreversible destruction of the biosphere. This isn't really in the manifesto, but he wrote about this in other writings. He believes that we're inevitably heading to a future where humans themselves are replaced by machines and we become surplus to requirements. And so any arguments about reform or about accelerationism, uh, they're kind of made moot, but I mean, it's like you want to accelerate and you think that will bring about the collapse of the system, but actually what you're accelerating towards is people being totally replaced by robots and then there is no future for us, right? Uh, we also can't rely on a political revolution because political revolutions are directed against some system that isn't the base of all of this, which is the technological system. But instead, they're directed at some secondary system like capitalism, but not the source of the problems. And the other aspect of it is if leftists got control because of their psychology, you know, if this was a Marxist revolution or something, because of their psychology, they couldn't be trusted to use any of this for good means or to reform it because they're so power hungry they're so spiteful that if they were the ones in charge they would just throw away all their principles and just use the power for their own ends and to destroy their enemies and to, grant, uh, to gain greater power and influence for themselves so there's no hope of any leftist revolution bringing any real change to the system now that's the, the basis of his worldview right um, and like I said, what's interesting is that, like, Ted's a mathematician. And you can see in his system, somewhat in, in the manifesto, but in his later writings, he gets a little bit more into it, where he, he's, try, he's doing this, he's taking this, like, Spinoza-like approach to these problems, or like Euclid or something, where he starts with a few propositions, um, and he, he tries to kind of, you know, abstract this into like a, you know, complex system and say, right, what's the key components of this? How do they interact? And what are they, like, if, if we kind of put these together in an equation, what's the end point of this? And that's the basis for his worldview, right? It's a very kind of scientific approach. Um, it's not really a deep, like, spiritual, sociological critique. It's like, you know, here's what humans are adapted for. Here's what the system has created. This is the gap between those two things. Therefore, people are going to be unhappy under the system. And, you know, here's what the system is inevitably heading towards based on these principles underlying it. And this will be the end point. Uh, therefore, we have to stop it, right? It's, it's very... Uh, it's very logical, it's very mathematical, um, and you can see the way he kind of tries to, to construct that with like as few propositions as possible. And so on that, it's interesting to look at his influences and how he formulated this. Uh, so while the ideas in his manifesto appear as novel insights, they're largely derived from three thinkers, right? There's the French philosopher Jacques Ellul, British zoologist Desmond Morris and the American psychologist Merton Seligman. Kaczynski owned an annotated copy of Alul's The Technological Society, 
And also in a 1996 letter, Kaczynski recommended two books that seem to give some support to the manifesto's assertion about the power process. Desmond Morris, The Human Zoo, and Martin E.P. Seligman, Hopelessness on Depression, Development, and Death. Now, this is kind of, uh, this is little discussed in the story of Ted, because he didn't really talk about his influences and there's kind of good reason for that because if he had you know in the manifesto if he had used citations and cited these authors it would have given more clues to the fbi uh especially if he was in correspondence sending letters to any of these guys um so he kept that quiet and you'll also see he changed some of the terminology a lot of these ideas are kind of adopted directly uh from these thinkers and he adds a new term for it that isn't even that different from the original term. Um, but it's no like conspiracy that he was uh, cribbing from these thinkers. He, he references their writing a lot in a, a letter to Scribina from prison. He also uh, referenced Seligman when he was talking about some of his theories about um, learned helplessness and over-socialization. Um, so yeah, Kaczynski hit his intellectual debt to these authors and invented his own terms for some of their concepts, as you'll see, over-socialization, power process, surrogate activities. And so let's take a look at these individually, right? So the most obvious influence on Kaczynski is uh, Jacques Ellul's idea of technique. Uh, I think Jacques Ellul is really the best writer philosopher uh, that tackled the technological question he obviously had very different conclusions from Kaczynski, right? Alul was a Christian, kind of a Christian anarchist, but he was certainly opposed to uh, revolutionary activity, especially violent revolutionary activity. But he's best known for his book, Technological Society, and his basic argument is against viewing technology as a neutral tool. Instead, we should think of technique, which is the term he uses, as encompassing all the methods and practices created by technology. Lull argued that technique was autonomous, self-perpetuating, and had its own deterministic logic that transcends human agency, which we have now surrendered to. And also this logic has certain tendencies like universalism, efficiency, and quantification. If you want an example, you can think of, right, technology advances, you start having uh, air travel, you have airports in different countries. But of course, to make the system work, you have to have uh, similar processes for directing these planes, right? You have to have similar uh, kinds of runways and, and similar methods that the air traffic controllers uh, use and so on, and similar security procedures. So in that sense, you can see how technology, which we see as, as neutral, we see as just something we use, uh, like latent in that is certain universalizing processes where we have to adopt universal standards between countries as an example, but also other things as well. I mean, the most obvious one is efficiency, that technology makes us start to think in terms of efficiency. Technology is obviously constantly perpetuating itself towards more and more efficiency. And this kind of, uh, it's like a reverse feedback on our own minds where we start to view everything technically um, Heidegger made similar kinds of critiques, right, where we begin to see everything as, as mere resources to be extracted. We start to see the forest as stand in reserve. Um, and there's a passage that Kaczynski cross-referenced that was annotated in his, in his copy of the Technological Society, where Lil says, the human is ill at ease in this strange new environment and the tension demanded of him weighs heavily on his life and being. He seeks to flee and tumbles into the snares of dreams. He tries to comply and falls into the life of organizations. He feels maladjusted and becomes a hypochondriac. That's obviously key to Kaczynski's worldview, right? The, the maladaptation, uh, uh, the maladaption between the way we live and, and technology and what we're programmed uh, for biologically. Obviously, Kaczynski is a little bit different from Alul. Uh, Alul is writing this very much from a, a sociological perspective he doesn't have this uh, sort of evolutionary biological insight that's not the way he's looking at this he's looking at this much more from his perspective uh, as a christian diagnosing these problems but you can see obviously the 
basis for Kaczynski's critique there, which we would build on. Um, a lot of critique of radicalism. Now, interestingly, people tend to see Kaczynski's critique of the left as like his most novel insight, right? To say, well, of course, uh, Jacques Lowe wrote about technological society and so on, but um, you know, Kaczynski's critique of leftism is very original. And a lot of it is, to be fair. Um, but this is also influenced by a little, because in another passage, Kaczynski cross-referenced, a little argued that none of the intellectual movements of the 20th century, whether that was communism, pacifism, surrealism, anarchism, existentialism, had, in his words, achieved their own goals of recreating the conditions of freedom and justice. However, they have been successful in pulling the teeth of aggressive instincts and in integrating them into the technical society. So obviously you can see the, the basis for Kaczynski's idea of the system's neatest trick is, is also there in Alul. But they diverge in that Alul roots his explanation. Uh, that should be the other way around. Uh, yeah, Kaczynski diverged from Alul in rooting his explanation in biological rather than sociological study. He also differs from Alul in arguing for a violent revolution of minority. Alul, a Christian, condemned revolutionary activity and he advocated a return to contemplation. Uh, Alul writes that it would present a vital breach in the technological society if a truly revolutionary attitude of contemplation could replace frantic activity. Uh, so Alul's solution uh, as a Christian is for individuals to return to Christ, to return to contemplation. And he had his own critiques of minoritarian activism of the kind that Kaczynski supported. Alul was very much against the idea of a minority vanguard leading the revolution. Uh, he was very against any kind of political terrorism. Now, so I said Kaczynski takes Alul, but he kind of switches from the sociological critique of him towards a more... Um, biologically rooted critique. And basically he adds to a lull with uh, Desmond Morris. Morris was a zoologist best known for writing The Naked Ape and The Human Zoo, the latter of which influenced Kaczynski. Uh, I quoted him in a previous slide where he, he recommended that book if someone wanted to understand the manifesto. Kaczynski adds Morris's evolutionary insights to Elul's sociological analysis. Morris wrote of the behavior exhibited by animals in zoos removed from what he called the stimulus struggle. So that's the first place we see one of Kaczynski's concepts in a, a previous thinker. This is what Kaczynski calls the power process. Because these species have evolved nervous systems that abhor inactivity, they have to find ways of maintaining a certain level of stimulation even when all of their other needs have been satisfied by the zookeepers. Otherwise, they will become bored and listless and eventually neurotic. Uh, Morris wrote about the behavior of these animals, that they harass uh, spectators, that they overgroom themselves. Um, they do all these kinds of, of surrogate activities when they're removed from, from the stimulus struggle. Uh, Morris argued that we see a similar situation in urban, as urban zoos, uh, by which he means cities, of course, where people are overcrowded. They have all their survival needs met and they can't express their territorial nature. And of course, there's bunch of other ways people's biological essence is denied uh, in urban environments. And then we get to surrogate activities, which Morris calls survival substitute activities, which is a more kind of self-explanatory way of putting this, right? Kaczynski's idea of surrogate activity is based on Morris's idea of survival substitute activity. Morris observed that many animals engage in distractions, such as excessive grooming or harassing spectators in order to maintain a stimulation. He argues that all human hobbies and pursuits, from stamp collecting to philosophy and art, serve the same survival substitute function for human beings. In the human zoo, this creativity principle is carried to impressive extremes. I've already pointed out that disillusionment can set in when the survival substitute activities of the stimulus struggle begin to seem pointless often because the activities chosen are rather limited in their scope. In avoiding these limitations, men have sought for more and more complex forms of expression, forms which become so absorbing that they carry the individual onto such high planes of experience that the rewards are endless. Here we move from the realms of occupational trivia to the exciting worlds of the, and uh, my screen is covered, so let me enlarge that, uh, of the fine arts, philosophy, and pure sciences. 
So it's a very reductive uh, idea by Morris, where he be. It's a more popular perspective today, right? To just totally reduce everything to survival value. But obviously, Morris is extremely reductive. He says everything from philosophy to art to science, everything is is just a survival substitute activity. And these ones that we glorify, like uh, art or literature or science. They're just especially satisfying because we have uh, very large brains and they keep our brains very active. Um, so yeah, quite reductive, but very influential on Kaczynski. This is where he gets the idea of surrogate activities. Even the title isn't very different from survival substitute activities. So you can see Kaczynski takes a little technological critique and instead of rooting it in sociology or Christianity, he roots it in this uh, evolutionary psychology basis. And then lastly, we have Martin Seligman, who's a psychologist, best known for the idea of learned helplessness. Again, it's a pretty popular, it's one of those like pop psychology ideas probably a lot of people have heard. And it's when an animal comes to believe that its behavior can't affect a set of outcomes, it then experiences psychological distress and becomes demoralized. In Seligman's experiments, dogs were subjected to a series of inescapable shocks. When these dogs were later subjected to shocks that they could escape from, Two-thirds exhibited learned helplessness. Instead of trying to escape, they lay down quietly and whined. The process was that they are obviously very agitated at first and do everything to uh, avoid these shocks, and then they get very depressed. And then at a certain point, their depression goes to acceptance, and they just uh, accept their fate. They stop trying to change it and uh, basically give up on life. And Kaczynski concluded that modern man is put in the same state as these dogs are by technological society. And that this explains many of the psychological problems of the modern world. Leftism is the political manifestation of learned helplessness. The leftist who has been over-socialized to internalize helplessness tries to gain a vicarious sense of power through participation in a powerful social movement. So, yeah, like I said, the way we socialize people is with a degree of shame. And, uh, you know, it's it's not the electric shocks of the dog. But at a certain point, um, you know, people are so shamed uh, or maybe just because of the biological leftists, uh, the biological makeup of the leftists, they feel uh, shame and despair so heavily that they adopt this kind of learned helplessness uh, aggravated by the system. And that's an important idea that Kaczynski comes up with himself, that leftism is like, it's this sublimated social movement where you have these people that have deeply internalized this learned helplessness and like physically, psychologically, constitutionally can't revolt against the fundamentals of the system. They are slaves to technological society, they are defeated and they are basically lashing out all of that they can do uh, because on some level they know that they're kind of slaves to the system uh, they they know that they've internalized uh, this shame they know that they've kind of surrendered to this larger process and so all they can really do is find something to kind of alleviate the shame and give them a, some sense of being in a power process, even if they don't have it individually, which they can do collectively through participating in these mass social movements. So that is Kaczynski's influences. I'm going to talk about what I think Kaczynski got right. Let me check the super chats. Take a break for this for a second. Vessel for $5 says, uh, great A content, Keith, keep it up, homeboy. Thank you, Vessel. Uh, Sovereign of Seas says, I remember reading the manifesto and being utterly underwhelmed. The amount of times, quote, I recognize some would argue against, uh, X against what I've just said, but here at FC, we still hold X arguments, came up, just made his worldview more vague than explained. Um, so yeah, Sovereign of Seas is saying Kaczynski is very much not justifying a lot of his uh, arguments, a lot of the deeper justifications from i actually agree with that and i'll get into my problems with kaczynski and where what i think the limitations of his critique is in a bit but yeah that's certainly key to it is it's uh 
it is this kind of naturalist like utilitarian critique and he does like appeal at certain times to concepts of fairness and morality but he really has no basis for appealing to any of this and even his his appeal to like glorifying nature over uh, the lives we experience in technological society obviously he has this critique based on a kind of utilitarian logic but he does seem to have a deeper sense of like a natural freedom that we have to recapture and i don't think he can justify that ultimately north c for 15 thank you north c I think as you and Joel have pointed out recently, most online right-wing men use politics as just another way of consuming content, surrogate activity. I will become a shill. Thank you for being a shill, Narcy, especially for me. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny, like people are in my chats and uh, they're going to, what, like five people are going to boycott my channel and stop watching because, I, uh, because I'm going to disagree with Ted Kaczynski. Uh, none of these people are very serious. Like I said, if they were, I don't think they'd be on a YouTube comment section spurging out about someone uh, doing a slideshow on uh, on this guy who died this week. Um, yeah, it is. That's the funny thing. The ironic thing is that is that is a surrogate activity by by Kaczynski. And if anything, Kaczynski would like resent them more, right? Because Kaczynski was totally opposed to any kind of uh, moderate. Uh, political activism or uh, partaking in some kind of uh, like something like nationalism like he's opposed to that obviously we know the we know exactly what he advocated for in terms of action right so yeah these people are like hanging, hanging around these circles they're on YouTube they're on Twitter uh, and their tread is that they're going to boycott a YouTube channel seriously uh, see so yeah, I don't take them very seriously but yeah it's a surrogate activity like you said people just hold these views they don't really do anything with them most people just are passive consumers of this content they don't contribute in any way uh you know they don't donate most of them aren't even bothered to like make a twitter account and just repost uh, stuff they agree with um so i don't think there's much respectable now obviously we have to encourage people to participate but it is a surrogate activity you're right uh, Serena JB said, I was disappointed to miss your 50,000 sub celebration stream. Glad I managed to catch this one. Thank you, Serena JB. And uh, yeah, you're doing great work on, on Twitter, actually. I think she's up to like 10,000 followers on Twitter. It's funny. She just posts um, solid like uh, nationalist talking points. She's constantly race you on uh, anti-whites on Twitter. That's, that's good stuff. Anonymous just sent $5. Thank you, Anonymous. Let's see. Uh, also anonymous uh, in the stream last week another anonymous sent a big super chat at the end that I never acknowledged but thank you whoever that was Reggie Mack said saying Uncle Ted was wrong unliked and unsubscribed just kidding keep up the good work I visited Ireland despite being a secret Ulster Scott and nobody knew the difference very best people that's great Reggie Mack um, yeah I think Ulster Scott's visiting <laughs> Ireland is probably the least of our, our worries right now. And yeah, thanks for the donation. Let me take a quick look at the YouTube chat. The chat looks very... I've been disappointed with the chat lately, I've got it, man. Someone said, Keith, be careful handling your mail. Okay. Uh, not much going on in the chat. Uh, let's see. Let me take a look at Cozy. Actually, I haven't opened. Uh, I haven't opened Cozy since this started. Let's see. Where are we in viewers? Hey, top of the Cozy charts. Two hundred and sixty-one viewers. Is this gonna make noise if I open it? Oh, there we go. Okay, take a look at the Cozy chat. Who's there? Boogly Woogly. I recognize him from Twitter. Uh, let's see which groupers are nice tonight. I saw Fuente has got his D Live channel back. That's pretty cool, right? It's uh, you know, I said a few days ago. I think like we'll see the, we look back and think the censorship peaked in 2021. It is looking like that. I saw Trovo was sending uh, email out to people they banned, like begging them to come back. And it was a stupid move, right? Because obviously they have 
Rumble to compete with now. They have Kick, which is going to be a competitor to uh, Trovo. Uh, sorry, uh, to what's the one that Amazon owns? Twitch. Twitch. I've never used Twitch, so it's never really been in my mind until recently. Until Kick came out. Um, but yeah, like what what a what a screw up by those platforms early on to kick everyone off. Uh, like D Live is a totally dead platform now. Trovo is totally dead, and. I mean, for a while, like, DLive actually was getting some pretty decent views, and it was because, you know, Fuentes did an election stream there that got, like, 100,000 views. Other right-wing content creators were uh, doing well there, bringing in a lot of money. And, yeah, they, they decided they didn't want any any anything controversial, anything political, and uh, they're kind of dead platforms now. But, it, look, it's a small positive to see all this censorship reversing. Okay, let's carry on with this. Get distracted, going off on a, a ramble. So what Ted got right. Now, he was right about maladaptive modernity. And I'm kind of focusing, when I talk about what he was right here, I'm kind of focusing on things that have kind of vindicated him since then. Maybe things that he didn't even foresee when he, when he wrote this. But as technological society has advanced, there has been a compounding effect of maladaptive behavior. Humans have never had it easier by conventional metrics, but physical and psychological well-being continues to decline while alienation increases. Now, obviously, I could post a thousand different uh, graphs, studies, whatever, to back that up. But I think everyone realizes, uh, yeah, things have progressed technologically. People are more depressed than ever, there's more suicides than ever etc 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 addiction uh, we know all these problems right it's pretty inescapable um technological advances have also allowed the propagation of people with heavy mutational loads who would not have survived without modern medicine this is an insight by uh, edward dutton and his colleague uh is it is it michael woodley or is it Tyrone, uh, the woodley guy all right um but yeah this is something i don't think ted would have uh, foreseen at the time but this idea that there was a high childhood mortality rate in pre-industrial societies and that this had a eugenic effect because people with high mutational loads have weaker immune systems and so they were more likely to die uh, things like premature birth or infections at a young age um, and half the human genome is in the brain so if you have a high mutational load in your immune system you'll have a high mutation load in your in your uh, brain and you get these quite dysgenic people that tend towards the quite maladaptive belief systems. Now, maybe I'm totally butchering that right whenever you talk about uh, these concepts. Uh, there's very fine distinctions. But there's certainly a lot of dysgenic effects of industrial civilization and of having like no childhood mortality pretty much now and modern medicine and so on. And there's all sorts of factors, uh, effects downstream from that that Kaczynski did not consider, but really kind of back up his point. Michael Woodley of Meany, yeah. Um, what was I thinking of a Tyrone Woodley? Where is that from? Uh, yeah, that's it. It's kind of hard to remember. That. It was like Michael Woodley of Meany. It's quite a, it's quite a, yeah, it's an interesting title. Left of psychology, I think he's also been very much vindicated on this. He said, and this is, very interesting. Tyrone Woodley's a UFC guy, is he? Okay, that does ring a bell. Okay, that's kind of funny. Um, Kaczynski wrote, Compassion and moral principle cannot be the main motives for leftist activism. Hostility is too prominent a component of leftist behavior. So is the drive for power. Now, this was very prescient because there's been recent psychological research on this. I actually did a thread on this that that's one Rogan retweeted. I think it has like almost 10 million views or something. Uh, but just talking about this insight and how it's been vindicated by recent psychology, this paper came out in March or so uh, that showed that uh, there's a high correlation between radical left-wing ideas, narcissism, and psychopathy, suggesting radical leftists do indeed use compassion as a mask for their power fantasies. The studies showed that... Uh, hold on, I have to ban someone in the chat keep seething racists okay you're banned uh the correlations between the constructs of antagonistic narcissism and left-wing authoritarianism are so high that they're almost the same thing so that's what was interesting in the research was they studied what they call left-wing authoritarianism basically left-wing radicals and 
they found that they don't have any higher levels of compassion. Actually, they have lower levels of compassion and they're not especially motivated by social justice or by the plight of the downtrodden. But what they do score very highly in is antagonistic narcissism and psychopathy. Uh, so clearly the activism they're engaging in is to satisfy kind of the needs of their ego, uh, to have power and dominance over people. And this vindicates some other researchers and writers from the 20th century as well, some of whom I covered in that thread, who made this observe, uh, observation about the Bolsheviks and so on, that the people involved tend to be very psychopathic, um, have very odd personality traits and really lack a sense of empathy. But what it cashes out to is they want the power process of being part of an ascendant movement where they can bully and dominate people. So this certainly vindicates Kaczynski's insights. And then other studies show the feelings of inferiority Kaczynski described are indeed much more prominent in leftists who have very elevated levels of mental illness. So that's a, this is a study I posted on my Telegram a while back. And it was basically how many people have been diagnosed with a mental illness. And you can see like the difference between liberals and conservatives. And then... Uh, Young white liberal women, 18 to 29, 56% have been diagnosed with a mental illness, which is majority. So obviously, uh, this is fairly consistent in terms of correlations between leftism and mental illness. And a another one of his insights that, pretty impressive, I think, to come up with this, you know, while we're giving Kaczynski his due, uh, he, he talked about this process where they... I guess uh, the critical race theory folks would call the kind of white saviorism when it's done by white liberals, but that implicitly, subconsciously, they see these groups they advocate for as inferior. And there's, there is also research that backed this up. Uh, it was a Yale study that found that white liberals actually dumb down their speech when they talk to minorities. They have a, they use a massively smaller vocabulary than they would when they talk to white people, whereas actually conservatives, uh, Republican voters actually use the same speech patterns talking to black people. So conservatives in the study were actually true believers uh, in equality, you could say, right? Like they they didn't assume that they had to simplify their language for the minorities they're talking to. The leftists do, which is kind of interesting because of course the leftists claim absolute equality between everyone, right? Why would you, uh, why would you make that assumption? Um, so that's, uh, another aspect of his theory of leftists that's backed up by research. And another thing Kaczynski is correct about, of course, is leftism and the system, his idea of the systems need a strike. Leftist rebellion has proven very compatible with the system. The leftist push for equality means universalizing and homogenizing humanity into a fungible mass of individuals, which is the same goal as neoliberal capitalism. Alternative means of authority and meaning to liberalism come under intense attack from the left, religion, the family, the nation. Leftists wage war against the strong gods of old to clear the way for the open society that capitalist oligarchs want. You can watch my recent video on uh, Karl Popper, George Soros, the open society. But yeah, that's the purpose of, of leftism and the kind of post-war order, order is they're, they're battering ram for, for the oligarchs, right? They... They're the kind of acid that just turns everything into sludge that can then be uh, repackaged as fungible tokens, be traded around the globe. And you can just look at how the values of the counterculture of the 1960s was adopted as the dominant culture of neoliberalism. Uh, everything the 60s radicals were uh, demanding, all of the values, uh, that's the culture today, right? Um, and they think they won. They think they... I guess some of them do anyway, you know, they think they kind of rebelled against their stuffy uh, Christian conservative parents. Um, but of course, you know, to use Kaczynski's way of describing it, they were really just kind of actualizing the desire that was already there on behalf of the technological system to move towards this more fluid, um, this, you know, like post-Fordist form of capitalism that's much more fluid, that's much more based on financialization and the free transfer the free movement of, of, of capital of labor um, 
and you know breakdown of traditional conservative institutions breakdown of the family of the nation state all of these things that would have been barriers to globalization and that was the so-called counterculture but it happened to be exactly what the, the system the direction the system was moving towards which you know from kaczynski's point of view isn't because it's not just because the the you know the oligarchs didn't like phone up uh, the hippies and say this is what we like we need people to have these values by the 1980s but it, it's it's that the leftist on some level like senses uh senses the direction things are going senses the implicit values of the system and it makes them explicit and actually demands them so in this way they kind of force along uh the process that's latent in the technological system on its own on the basis of its own internal logic anyway they actualize it they externalize it they make it explicit and that's a great insight by kaczynski he's writing on that is really interesting but now of course while you're all here right what ted got wrong disagreements with kaczynski uh i'll take another quick look at the super chats um okay <laughs> maybe i should read this at the end so i can uh so I can put this video up on its on its own. I won't have to cut this out. Yeah, I think I'll leave that for the end, uh, Uncle A. <laughs> thank you. And you said that twice, by the way, but uh, thank you for the, the two donations. So okay, I guess I'll just keep going, right? Maybe I'll take another quick look at the the super at the uh, at the live chat. Not much happening. Not very interesting. Oh, there's JF. I'm guessing that's the real JF. Uh, see, now the pressure's on because I've got this like high IQ autistic French Canadian is going to like pick apart everything I say. But I'm going to make I'm going to make like a small stumble and use a wrong term, and JF is just going to like butcher me for three hours on a live stream. So that's why I tried to do some prep for this because. You know, when JF comes at you with a, a video response, that's been a career ender, right? That was, uh, you know, Crouton T. That's how JF got famous. You, some of you are too young, you won't remember this, but JF got famous because he entered into these race realism debates that were happening in the old days of the alt right. And uh, this guy, Crouton T, was like a liberalist, a central, uh, centrist. He was like in that kind of Sargon crowd. He went hard attacking the alt right, trying to prove like race realism is fake. And then JF, this high IQ biologist, comes along and he starts doing these well-prepared essays and just totally embarrasses this crowd guy. I think there was a famous uh, quote uh, about fish getting pregnant uh, that, that showed the crowd just like totally didn't understand biology at all. And uh, but yeah, you know the the JF video essay, right? You got to be you got to be on top of your game if you're if you're preparing for one of those coming at you. Um, and some people were asking me to debate him, but I gotta say, I actually like the, it's more like old school YouTube, like the video response. Like, again, that's kind of something I remember from the old days of sort of the, you know, distant right on, on YouTube. Like you used to be able to do a direct video response where you tag their video in it. And uh, yeah, that's the famous quote. Let me pull that up. <laughs> But yeah, you used to get these great back and forths between all these all these YouTubers. I like the idea of that. Like, I like the video response where you can actually like take someone's argument and spend a week like just deconstructing everything they said, just totally like tearing apart their entire worldview. Um, I like that. It kind of keeps everyone on top of their game, right? There's a lot of uh, like in debate. Sometimes it's just the debate, the best debater that wins. But when you have like the videos that are up and there's like a permanence to them. I think it's a good way to kind of work out these questions, but yeah, I'm sure Jeff is going to totally tear this apart. I already know like the, uh, the issue he's going to have is the same debate I've had with Jeff before about like materialism versus idealism. Um, the basis for materialist worldview. So uh, unfortunately I think we're going to be, we're going to be retreading all ground. We're, we're destined to do this forever. You and I, Jeff, it's going to be, uh, we're going to be, going back and forth on materialism forever um so kaczynski's ethics i wanted to just do this as a bit of background so like to get deeper into his worldview like i presented what's in the manifesto what his basis of critique is and you can see already like i said it's not this kind of spiritually based uh 
technology is desacralizing things or like the more pentilinkula, like, you know, the inherent beauty of undisturbed wilderness. It is a very kind of human centric critique and it's kind of utilitarian uh, and that he's talking about human happiness. But let me just get into this. I'll put this full size so I can read it. So I wanted to get a bit deeper into what's actually underlying this. How does he justify any of this? What's his presuppositions? Now, Kaczynski warned that conventional morality is a means of system control, but he did distinguish between this and what he called natural morality. What is this? Well, Kaczynski's a materialist, so he didn't believe in any transcendent basis for ethical statements. So what is the basis for Ted's ethics? Ted seems to believe that there are ethical norms we can all intuit, and he writes in one of his letters, in a discussion of this kind, one must rely heavily on intuitive judgment. As an example, he identifies good purposes, such as discouraging child abuse or racial hatred. He thinks that these are obviously bad things that we can all agree on, right? Child abuse and racism. And finally, Kaczynski seems to hold suffering as the greatest evil. This is kind of the ultimate foundation of all of this. He writes of the immense suffering caused by technological society and in justifying his actions writes that, quote, it is not at all certain that the survival of the system will lead to less suffering than the breakdown of the system would. So Ted is a materialist. Secondly, he's an ethical intuitionist. And thirdly, he seems to be guided by a kind of negative utilitarianism. And then lastly, although I said Kaczynski has a very utilitarian critique, it isn't very airy-fairy, um, look at the beauty of the undisturbed nature he does give some intrinsic value that he never really spells out to the kind of freedom we experience in a more natural environment right it's not just that uh it's our natural power process and it satisfies our basic needs he does seem to attach like an intrinsic value to animals humans being in their natural state rather than this artificial um technological system but like i said he never really gets into this so much but that's kind of the fundamental basis right because in his in his final justification for the kind of revolution he advocates for his final justification is about suffering it's about the system is causing this much suffering obviously he spelled it out with the power process uh why the technological society causes suffering and his basis for calculating the justification for revolution is, well, if we collapse it now, that will be less suffering than if we let it go on, accelerate, and so on. So I don't think it's a very worked out ethic. Uh, I mean, my contention would be that if you're a materialist, you can't have any kind of ethic, and there's really no basis for any of this. Good purposes, such as discouraging child abuse or racial hatred. Well, why is child abuse bad if you're materialist? Why is racial hatred bad if you're materialist? Uh, he thinks we'll all agree to that. And, okay, maybe everyone reading it agrees that racial hatred is bad. But that doesn't mean that there's some uh, objective basis for that beyond individuals uh, agreeing on it. Um and he, that's my contention, is that he fundamentally can't bridge that gap. He has this naturalist ethics, and he doesn't seem troubled by the traditional problems of holding a naturalist ethics. In fact, he doesn't really seem to be aware of the many philosophical presuppositions he's bringing into play here. He talks about, uh, you know, I talk about the natural ethics that he describes versus conventional ethics. And he does outline this a little bit. I think it's in another one of his letters to Scribina, maybe, or maybe it was, a, I think it was a separate essay, actually. Um, but he identifies like six planks of this like natural morality, which is like, you don't lie to people, you fulfill contracts, uh, you know, in a very basic way you do unto others as they would do unto you. But again, this is very subjective. You can always find a tribe, a people, or even an individual that doesn't share this uh, ethical intuition. And even if they do, even if everyone shares it, if it's, you know, if we're just, uh, if, if we're just meat sacks, as Ted thinks we are, all of this is just an evolutionary ad adaptation to aid in survival. So it's not binding on anyone. Um, you know, why, why would you follow any of these uh, principles of fairness? Anyway, back to the slide. So ethics involves normative claims about how we ought to behave 
while the world of the materialist is in perpetual flux with no objective meaning, purposes, or ethical value. Kaczynski doesn't explain how he bridges the gap from the is of nature to the ought of his ethical prescriptions. So this is the, you know, a very standard uh, problem in philosophy. Um, how do you bridge that gap? Okay, you can say people uh, have an intuition of fairness. You can say you want people to adhere to that. Why should they? And at that point, to go from the ought to the is, uh, you just have this kind of infinite reg regress. They'll say, well, it's good for survival. You say, well, why is survival a good thing? They'll say, well, you know, if we're uh, if we survive, then we can perpetuate the species. You say, why is that a good thing? They say, well, you know, we can enjoy X, Y, Z. You say, well, why is that an ultimate good? You really can't bridge that gap. And so it's just kind of so many words when Kaczynski says we have this natural morality that everyone ought to follow and that we ought to reduce suffering um, and that, you know, we ought to return to a more traditional uh, pre-industrial way of life. It's just so many words. Ted's appeal to shared moral intuitions can't bridge the gap. What may be considered morally abhorrent for one people in one time may be normative in another. And Kaczynski illustrates this problem himself when he uses the example of racial hatred and child abuse as things we all agree are cases of evil. Though there may be general agreement on this in the modern West, this is far from universal. Treating racism as especially evil or unnatural is itself quite a modern idea brought about by technological society. While primitive cultures are certainly not free of what we would consider child abuse. So, yeah, he he kind of gives the whole problem away there, right? He's a, he's a naturalist, he's a materialist, he wants pre-industrial civilization. And then to ground his worldview, he says, well, okay, you know, uh, I don't know some like transcendent base for ethics or something, but obviously we can all agree on right and wrong, right? And then... What's his example? It's racism. It's like, okay, well, that's been considered like evil for the last like 70 or 80 years of all of human history. And, you know, we didn't have a word for it until like last Thursday uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but you're taking that as like our sort of fundamental, a fundamental ethical intuition we have. I mean, that itself kind of throws shade on the whole process here. Uh, because is, is that just something we discovered was evil in the 20th century? Uh, we only discovered it was evil through uh, industrial society and the the ways of life that encouraged. So it's I don't think it's possible for him to to bridge that gap. And you know what we consider child abuse, you could point to plenty of of examples in in primitive society. Someone says child abuse has always been wrong, though. Yeah, but there are tribes where, like, you know, children literally get eaten, right? And to them, that's not wrong because that's something they do for whatever reason they do it. Whether it's uh, what about the tribes in the Amazon where they believe that kids, uh, some children born, have an evil spirit inside them and they go off and, uh, like, leave them in a hole in the Amazon and uh, just leave them to die there, right? And even not that long ago in our own history, uh, some things like happen like this with infanticide, right? So we can all agree child abuse is wrong. Well, can we? Uh, well, not every people in the world does. Not every people in history did. Uh, certainly not every primitive people. So, yeah, I mean, like you have this guy in the chat saying, well, it's obviously wrong. Well, to you, it's obviously wrong. But what happens if someone disagrees with you? Well, I don't know. Maybe you're religious. Maybe you have some kind of appeal to make. What's... Ted's basis, if someone disagrees and there's a tribe uh, that says that if your child is, is born with a, a club foot that you have to bury them upside down uh, in a hole in the Amazon. I mean, that's uh, what's, you know, what's the kind of what's the basis for normativity in any of this? Again, it's just so many words. And like that's the the whole problem is the kind of distant right is like this is such an insightful critique but it's it's there's no like foundational basis for any of it so at the end of the day it comes down to one man's preference for uh, utilitarian ethic which not everyone shares um and this is obviously rooted in his materialism which has other effects on his worldview, Kaczynski's, uh, Kaczynski wrote in a letter from prison that he was a materialist, plain and simple, and that all human behavior can in principle be explained through the laws of physics. 
Kaczynski wrote that he believed machines could eventually replace human minds completely, writing, quote, I'm enough materialist to believe that the human brain functions solely according to the laws of physics and chemistry. In other words, it is, in a sense, a machine, so it should be possible to duplicate it artificially. This justified Kaczynski's pessimistic views about the future of AI. Like I said, he wrote of his belief that humans would eventually be totally replaced by AI, and that then the system would have no need for humans and we would likely go extinct. Uh, well, again, I think the foundations of this are rather weak. There's a number of reasons to reject materialism. I've done videos on this in the past. I mean, this is obviously, again, like a pretty big topic in uh, philosophy. I'm not going to do... Uh, this will obviously be the main focus of, like, JF disagreeing with me, but uh, I'm not going to do an entire... I mean, this could be a two-hour video itself, but yeah, there's the hard problem of consciousness. That is, how can uh, how can matter? How can uh, the natural world produce something that is quite qualitatively distinct, which is consciousness? Which, regardless of what its relation to the brain is, it has uh, this unique first-person ontology where there is a nature of subjective experience that is not identical to the physical processes in the brain associated with it. And so, therefore, a materialist reductionist picture of the world leaves something out, which is that first-person ontology that has to enter into any picture of the universe. Schopenhauer said something like, materialism is uh, the philosophy of the subject that forgets itself. Right? That's, that's very true. You can't... Uh, Ultimately, any truth, any equation, any observation happens in consciousness, and materialism ends with the denial of consciousness, uh, which is just can't get off the ground as a worldview. Epistemology, if you make a claim to truth, if you say that the brain is just a machine that is uh, programmed by evolution, uh, then it's just programmed for survival, then you can't really make a claim to an objective truth. What would a truth even be? What would the laws of logic be? Uh, what would truth or falsity be? These aren't uh, these aren't physical, spatio-temporal things. You're appealing to something immater immaterial and universal and eternal in a sense, and you can't make that appeal on materialism because it wouldn't make any sense for that to exist in a materialist universe. So you can't make any claim to truth. So therefore, you can't claim materialism is true. Problems of emergence. How do more complex uh, uh, what would you say, complex forms or complex uh, substances uh, emerge from very simple physical processes. The materialist, again, has a very hard time explaining this, uh, not least when it comes to consciousness. And, of course, ethics. Uh, some of the aspects are discussed with uh, Kaczynski's uh, issue of ground and his ethics. Um, how can any normative statement come from a materialist worldview? Everything is in flux. Everything is just an evolutionary adaptation for survival. Nothing is inherently better or worse than anything else. And so trying to have any kind of ethical worldview on the basis of this uh, can't get off the ground. Now, if reductive materialism is not true, the mind is much more complex than the materialist imagines. If the mind can't be reduced to physical processes, it's unlikely that it can be recreated by mimicking these processes. But many of the arguments for strong AI assume that the processes of the mind can be replicated by computation. Leaving out the many aspects of cognition intertwined with our embeddedness in the world. Uh, again, I won't totally get into this because I've talked about this before in videos and it would just be too long of a, a detour. I'm just having a look at the chat. Imperius, is, Imperius always has some interesting comments. So when I, when I see his name pop up, it kind of catches my eye. I want to see what he's saying. Um, but more importantly, if we are just deterministic meat sacks and technology can solve the problems, uh, rather solve the causes of suffering Kaczynski identified, what reason would Ted have to reject it? Why not opt for a life of bliss in the singularity? He has no metaphysical basis on which to privilege agency or natural life. And th this is really the, this is what it all comes down to, right? This is the fundamental problem. And, uh, you know, me and Jeff, uh, me and Jeff will never agree on, on materialism, but I, I'm not sure he can answer this question either, right? Kaczynski says, the system is bad because it causes suffering. It causes suffering because there's a mismatch between what we're adapted to. Uh, if you look at evolutionary psychology and what the technological system provides, the fact that it provides for all our basic needs, we can't enter into the power process. So it comes down to this critique that it's inevitably going to cause suffering. Well, what if, you know, what if we 
could have less suffering by the system. At some point in his writings, he says he doesn't write off that that's possible, but to get there would be so would cause so much suffering along the way that it's not worth it. But what if we could uh, fast track to that point, right? What if you could create the power process? What if you could create the simulation of a power process? What if you could enter the singularity and a perfect transhuman happiness? And if you say, well, transhuman happiness wouldn't satisfy the power process, well, what if you can just simulate the power process, but in a way that's even more satisfying, that's even more, gives more of a sense of freedom and more of a sense of autonomy than the real thing? Ted seems to hold that the naturalness of doing this in a pre technological state, there's an inherent goodness to that that actually isn't reducible to any of the material utilitarian calculations. But why? What's the basis for that? If you're a materialist and if all you care about is eliminating suffering, why not take the Yuval Noah Harari position that we can totally eliminate suffering with enough chemicals, uh, enough chemical adjustments of the brain and the proper simulations uh, to give people a happy life? I don't think Kaczynski ultimately has an objection to that that isn't just, um, you know, trying to push it back further and say, well, this ultimately would still cause more suffering because X, Y, Z. But if you can satisfy that hypothetical and say with the technological system, you could eliminate suffering. I don't see how a materialist uh, opposes that. Now, another problem, obviously, is practicality. Uh, it's just not realistic, anything Kaczynski wanted. Um, someone is saying underwhelming my moral, prefer my moral preference. Well, that's kind of like the... Uh, I mean, that's kind of the basis for a worldview is like having an ethics. I mean, if you're going to make claims that you think are universal, that you're, you're telling people they should uh, do actions towards, you kind of have to have a basis for it. So it actually kind of is uh, it pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty significant if someone has no basis for their worldview, right? It's not exactly uh, uh, like, you know, a, a small detail that this worldview is totally arbitrary. Uh, I think that's pretty significant, actually. Um but yeah, barring something like a nuclear holocaust, it's difficult to envision how the pre-technological world he desired could come about. It would cause the deaths of billions, almost certainly, and require a global effort. Um, and certainly his actions didn't bring us any nearer. I mean, a lot of people have read the manifesto because of it, but it had no real effect. I consider it pretty much a pointless waste of life. And anything he outlined, I just don't see it as anywhere close to realistically happening. So what would collapse technological civilization? Like I said, it would have to be a, a nuclear holocaust of the kind that we can't even fathom. And certainly we can't do anything to bring about. And the other problem with this is technological development is not something we can uh, collectively just forget. If technological civilization arose once, why would it not arise again? Certain people groups, like the Japanese, immediately modernized on encountering technological civilization. Uh, and that's one of the real problems. It's like, everyone has a revealed preference. Most people have a revealed preference for this stuff. I mean, most people could go and live a much less uh, technological life. Most people could live without a smartphone. Most people could live without a washing machine if they really wanted, right? But we have this revealed preference for all of these things. Now, if technological civilization collapsed, um, are we just going to collectively pretend that that stuff doesn't exist or that we can't like get back to that state? I just don't see how that would happen. You'd have to have like a fallout um, Brotherhood of Steel type thing, right? But Kaczynski doesn't want a global revolution or a political leadership to any of this. So again, I just don't see why any of this is feasible. Primitivists answer that for most of our species history, we existed without civilization, but like I said, we would retain the memory of technological uh, innovations and our species itself has been changed by civilization. Um, and again, this is something I could get like much deeper into in terms of, you know, you could look at Julian Jaynes and this idea of the bicameral mind and that we were like psychologically, uh, spiritually like different creatures. Um, prior to the axial age like we uh, we didn't have this sense of an ego of a self that we had a separation between the right and left hemispheres and people would just hear commands from the right hemisphere and immediately act on them thinking it was their ancestors or gods or spirits or something 
So we are like constitutionally changed by civilization. Even if you don't accept those theories, um, you know, we have been adapting in this artificial environment for thousands of years now. And yeah, it's all to underscore, like it's difficult to envision how you just kind of come out of that on the opposite side. Uh, Green Frog Good says, it's not arbitrary, you're just refusing to engage in good faith. Uh, no, it is arbitrary. What's the basis for a naturalist ethics? What's his basis for saying that suffering is bad and we should eliminate suffering? That's arbitrary. Uh, if you're a materialist, if it's all just flux, why is suffering any worse than anything else? Um, what's not good faith in this? I've pretty much... Uh, I mean, I've pretty comprehensively gone over his, his justifications and gone into his letters and everything for how he justifies it, but I don't think you know what arbitrary means in, in philosophy and in ethics if you're saying that that's bad faith. Um, so yeah, there's no realist, if there's no realistic path to Kaczynski's desired outcomes, we should pursue alternatives. And then, of course, there's a martial incentive. Much technological development was driven by warfare. If humanity collectively disarms itself, uh, there would be a massive incentive for any one people to regain the technological advances of old, leaving, leaving others defenseless. There would seemingly be no way to prevent this except the world police. This isn't something I saw Kaczynski write about much, is the way um, conflict and warfare and the need for defense against other countries' technological developments drove technology. You, know, you look at how many technological innovations that shaped this century were developed by like US military and related branches. I'm getting distracted by the chat again. I've got, I've got, I've got to stay more focused. Um, but yeah, this isn't something he really discusses, but again, why would this disappear, right? Uh, there'd be seemingly be no way to prevent this except the world police. Again, he doesn't, He's against a political solution. He's against a political centralized leadership to any of this. But there's always going to be an incentive. Like I said, people can't just forget this. There's always going to be an incentive for one tribe, one people group to re-engage in that like Faustian civilizational process that is iterative, that is expansive, that ended up where we are now. And Kaczynski just doesn't seem to really think about how you would prevent that kind of cyclical development. And an ecological, this is something that you never really see discussed as well, right? You have all of these deep green people on the distant right that they're, they're eco-fash and they love nature and they're pagans and they love Ted Kaczynski and they love Penty Linkola and, uh, you know, poor Uncle Ted died and they're going to plant a tree in his honor. The problem is most of... Uh, well, firstly, I guess there's two problems. But firstly, like I said, most of Kaczynski's arguments are focused on technology's effect on human well-being. Um, but, of course, he was somewhat moved by environmental destruction caused by technology. Uh, we'll never know to what extent, but like I said, the story is that he saw his favorite walking path being destroyed by uh, road building, and that, that's what set him off. So he clearly had some sense of ecological harmony that he was uh, deeply concerned about. But the problem is, if one really has a biocentric view, there are a number of reasons to think a collapse of industrial society would be a net negative for the biosphere. Now, remember, his whole justification for bringing about collapse was it will cause a lot of suffering. But if we don't bring it about, the alternative, which is a continuation of technological society, is going to be much, much worse. But I think on ecological grounds, that's not the case. Collapse is actually bad. It's really bad for the environment. And this could be this list could go on for that you could list a hundred reasons here right but if a breakdown of technological civilization were to occur it would create a desperate rush to extract available resources and this would likely be exacerbated by conflict right the amount of our food supply the amount of things we take for granted that exists thanks to these very complex supply chains uh industrialization you know the green revolution and uh, these pesticides that are transported across the world. If that disappears, obviously, there's going to be a massive uh, rush for resources. Um, and that's going, to be, that's going to be bad for the environment. That's going to be bad for ecology. The collapse of technological infrastructure would also lead to massive immediate increase in pollution. For example, disappearance of waste treatment technology, polluting water supplies, 
that would be another immediate effect. Um, you'd have an immediate massive pollution of the water systems. Um, but consider technology, right? Uh, consider nuclear technology, consider nuclear waste and how we dispose of that. Um, you have all of these very complex procedures and facilities uh, dedicated to that that would decay and dilapidate over time. Uh, you know, think of something like the the safe zone in Chernobyl that was set out, that massive like concrete structure. Um, but that's that's kind of a, an obvious example. But there's so many like pollutants, chemical pollutants that are produced by the industrial system. Uh, there's just there's so much infrastructure and processes that would collapse overnight that would have really, really unforeseen consequences on the environment. Existing infrastructure for conservation would disappear. There would be no barriers to exploiting vulnerable ecosystems. Infrastructure and regulation controlling disposal of pollutants would also disappear. The remaining human population would likely be way beyond pre-civilization levels. Without the technological basis for mass food production, populations would resort to overhunting and exploiting available food resources. There would likely be a rush out of urban areas for farmland causing deforestation and soil erosion. Um, sorry, again, I'm reading the chat. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, Tegazinski was against primitivism and he wrote a few essays in response to primitivists like John Zerzan and some of these people that wanted to go back. Like Kaczynski said, the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. Zerzan corrected him and said, actually, it was the agricultural revolution. And we need to go back to like hunter gatherer societies. Kaczynski didn't favor that. He said there's too much population for that to be possible. So people will just go back to farming low tech after the collapse of industrial society. Uh, now, if you have that many people trying to farm without industrial technology, that counts. For, I think, you know, I think the green revolution and what that makes possible in terms of uh, the industrial processes and like artificial ways that food is grown, it accounts for like 95% of, of the food production um, in the US at least, uh, but that's really across the developed world. Now, if all of that is gone and if all these supply systems break down, right, everyone is going to, you know, there, there would literally be like billions of people starving to death and they're going to interrogate anything they can. And that's not going to be very good for the environment or for the ecosystem or for the survival of threatened uh, species or forests. Um, it's definitely going to be worse than in, in the long run if you just have a sort of decline in population that we have now with industrial society. And future advances in conservation efforts made possible by technology would be lost forever. Um, you know, you can write some of that off in terms of how weak conservation efforts are compared to the uh, destruction being done by the industrial process. But there are technological innovations uh, that is going to lessen the strain uh, on various uh, environmental systems and they would be lost. And like I said, you'd have all of these other factors that would force people to exploit the environment worse than anyone could ever imagine. So collapse would actually be really, really bad for the environment. Especially the kind that Kaczynski wanted to bring about, which was instant, uh, not politically organized, um, not driven by a state, but just this kind of anarchistic collapse. Now, technology and decentralization I also think Kaczynski got wrong the direction of technology necessarily. He didn't write off industrial society eventually reaching what he called a low level of physical and psychological suffering. I think I already mentioned this, but he believed that that could only come at the cost of permanently reducing human beings and many other living organisms to engineered products and mere cogs in the social machine. Kaczynski warned that in the future, quote, due to improved techniques, the elite will have greater control over the masses. Kaczynski wrote his manifesto at the peak of the nuclear age when information was being consolidated into a handful of sources. Since then, several devolutionary trends have called into doubt the proposition that technology would inevitably strengthen elite control. Mass proliferation of certain technologies can contribute to the flourishing of less alienated neo-tribal communities. Um, now, I believe the majority of the chat will probably disagree on this. But I think if you look at the way technology has gone, I talked about this in my video on AI, 
that the process has really kind of reversed where instead of having these sort of Orwellian super states that have very expensive uh, centers of technology and information, everyone has a smartphone in their hands. Um, to the mass proliferation of technology is tending towards decentralization and having it, making it more difficult to have these 20th century means of control. And I think the Kaczynski's claim that techniques inevitably head in the direction of centralization and elite shaping of the masses. I think that's been proven wrong. And I think the chat will probably disagree with that, but I think we'll see more and more that that will be proven wrong in years and decades to come. And I think you can agree uh, or you can think of a lot of different technologies in terms of the innovations now that are extremely devolutionary, whether that's uh, crypto or you think of the way media control has gone and the collapse in, in centralized media institutions. And all these things seem quite small. It's like, okay, well, the elites still have, uh, you know, they still have the banks and the, the governments and so on. But uh, we're in a very sort of early stage of this process. I think it's, it's going to uh, accelerate. I just, I think, Kaczynski's central claim there about, you know, the kind of mathematical inevitability of that process is wrong. It's not as deterministic as he believed. Um, no, the goods of civilization. Obviously, this is another thing. As a materialist, Kaczynski considered science, philosophy, and art, and everything else you can think of as surrogate activities. He recognizes no inherent value in the pursuit of transcendence, reducing it to the same status as any other hobby. Um, and Skurbina actually asked Kaczynski about this in one of the letters. He said, hey, well, if industrial civilization collapses, uh, if we go back to the more primitive stage you want and we lose all of these great cultural productions, wouldn't that be a great shame? And Kaczynski kind of, he didn't say that he wants to destroy them, but he just said, well, you know, it's not really a, it's not a goal to destroy them, but if they are destroyed, like, you know, whatever, that's just kind of a side effect. Uh, what would happen if industrial civilization stays around is worse anyway, so kind of who cares? So he doesn't see it as a goal to destroy the great artifacts of civilization, but he doesn't seem to have attached any value to actually preserving them. And why would he? Uh, in that sense, he's just being kind of consistent in his sort of utilitarian, like, materialist point of view here that art, philosophy, literature, they're just surrogate activities that these highly evolved apes did to distract themselves from having their basic needs satisfied and they don't really have any uh, ultimate value. And also technology unleashes potential in the national and civilizational collective, which would not otherwise be possible. Now, I'm kind of cheating there. I really shouldn't have left that one sentence. That's like probably worthy of, of a much longer discussion um, which I don't think I'll expand on now, but yeah, if you value a, a kind of tribal uh, collective success or kind of um, uh, ethnic consciousness or, or the achievements of civilization, it's all to say that Kaczynski doesn't attach any value to any of these things. And this is, you know, it's kind of a final, like fundamental, like what is the point of all of this, right? Kaczynski doesn't have a very developed theory of freedom, um, what constitutes human freedom. He sees no higher state for the individual than satisfaction in a natural environment. And again, in terms of like his basics, in terms of what's underlying his worldview, he appeals to freedom a lot. He never really explains what freedom is. And I think he takes for granted this modern utilitarian view that freedom is just like choice. It's like consumer choice, or it's like you can just choose... Uh, choose to be what you want and in the case of the uh in the case of kaczynski's more primitive idea of freedom it's more autonomous it's about autonomy it's about that you are providing for yourself uh it's not that you push a button on a machine and uh your day's uh, calorie intake comes out it's that you're autonomously independently uh providing for yourself and from that he makes this utilitarian argument against civilization and of course he would, because he sees no higher state for the individual than satisfaction in a natural environment. But of course, if you're not a materialist, and I believe in a kind of perennial view on things, I have a kind of religious pluralist perspective that I think all of the axial age religions have an underlying metaphysics that is based in um, 
mystical revelation that does and did unveil a fundamental truth about the human condition and about the purpose of life here. That is that all of these uh, spiritual systems, despite their differences, they're all directed at directness away from an ego centered perspective on life towards the real, uh, towards a reality centered perspective uh, that is uh, transcendent that is outside the individual um and in the traditional view the purpose of high civilization which is related to that is contemplation civilization should provide the necessary conditions to explore the mysteries of existence seek transcendent truths and contemplate god i bet jf is smashing his desk right now it should encourage practices such as meditation prayer and self-discipline which help individuals transcend the limitations of ego and connect with the divine or higher aspects of consciousness these are not surrogate activities but the fulfillment of man's life as a spiritual being leisure is the basic precondition for religious and intellectual life so my basic contention is that there are higher states of consciousness than the uh, animalistic state that immediately satisfying the biological urges that our process of development has been to uh, integrate and transcend previous uh, lower states of existence and that uh, in the axial age we took one such leap where we moved to a more um, reality-centered uh, universalizing perspective and that this is actually a development and that actually we fundamentally can't uh, go back from that even if we wanted to According to all axial age religions, true freedom is neither the absence of external constraints or the ability to satisfy immediate biological desires without hindrance. The first of those would be the transhumanist idea of freedom. The second is, is Kaczynski's idea of freedom. Instead, genuine freedom lies in the liberation of one's true self from the bonds of ignorance and desire. And aligning it with higher truths. So, in conclusion, Kaczynski's insights about left psychology are brilliant, though they owe a debt to other thinkers that's often uh, overlooked. While Kaczynski was correct about the determinism of technique, which he took from Elul, who's a fantastic thinker, uh, it's not quite moving in the direction he foresaw. I do believe it's not as centralized and dystopian as he foresees. Uh, and I think there are decentralized and disintermediate and trends and technology that will encourage more tribal forms of existence. Kaczynski could see no inherent value in the achievements of high civilization because of the limitations of a philosophical outlook. And even if it were possible to bring about the collapse of technological society, the cost to the biosphere would be immense and it could be all for nothing since there's no reason to expect technological society to re-emerge after collapse. No reason not to expect that should be. The anti-tech revolution Kaczynski desired is not feasible. His violent actions did not bring it any closer and it was a pointless loss of life. So after two hours of this presentation, you kill people, right? That is a, I did get that in there, right? That's, you know, people were saying that was the, the only argument against Kaczynski. But look, if it's not feasible, which I don't think it is, if it would come back again, and that would ultimately all be for naught, if it would cause the massive ecological catastrophe that is greater than anything industrial society is causing, and if Kaczynski is actually wrong about that utilitarian calculus about it's better to collapse it now than wait for it to get worse, if collapse it now, it's actually way worse. If all of that is true, and not even to mention all of that, but also his individual actions like didn't bring it any closer and didn't really fundamentally change anything, well... It was a pointless loss of life. It was unjustified. Uh, you know, blowing up a guy in a computer store. Um, I'm against that, all right? I know it's controversial, but I'm against it, right? But that's my take on Ted Kaczynski. Thanks for attending my TED Talk. Uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. I think I was pretty fair. I mean, like I said, I've read his writings extensively. I've read Chad Hag, who is really a serious, serious guy that's really given serious thought to Kaczynski. And same with Skrbina, who's a, a trained philosopher who had correspondence with Kaczynski, who worked really hard to understand his worldview. I've looked at all of them. I think I've pretty fairly presented his view here. Some people were complaining that I was just going to 
do the typical attacks on him. But I think um, I think this is pretty fair. Uh, look, he wanted people to engage with his ideas. He wanted uh, he wanted uh, discussion around these things. I do think it's important discussion. Like I said, I was influenced myself a lot by Jacques Ellul. And it's a question of our time in a sense, right? That's why Elon Musk was commenting on, on his debts and maybe he was right. That's why everyone is talking about the threat of AI and so on. These are certainly relevant questions, but I think Kaczynski missed the mark for the reasons I outlined. Now, I may upload this as a single video to YouTube. So if that is the case, then thanks for tuning in and take care.